welcome everybody to this uh, meeting at Marxism, System Crash Debate and the Poly Crisis. My name's Hope, I'm a member of the Socialist Worker Party in Birmingham. Just to explain a little bit about uh, how this is going to run, we're going to have two speakers today, Alex Klinikos, who's a leading member of the Socialist Workers Party, has also authored many books that can be found on footmarks, uh, including his new book, The New Age of Catastrophe. And we're going to also have Adam Toos, who's a well-known writer, a uh, historian and economist. Uh, he's the writer of several best-selling books and writes extensively on the financial crisis. They're going to be almost in conversation together. Alex is going to speak for about five minutes and then him and Adam are going to go back and forth. Just to say, we will have plenty of time uh, for discussion from the floor. There are people in pink shirts uh, carrying around what are called speaker slips. If you would like to speak, please indicate to one of those, uh, take the slip and then give it back to them. Um, all right, well, I'm going to hand over to Alex now. Thanks. Uh, that's very kind. Uh, welcome everyone, and particularly welcome Adam Tooze from New York. Uh, we've got two. We've got two New Yorkers uh, speaking simultaneously. We've got Chris Balls in person speaking uh, at one of the other in one of the other sessions, and we've got Adam. Uh, speaking virtually from New York, which is, which is great. Now, um, the theme of this session is debating the poly crisis. Um, and I want to start slightly oddly by quoting something I saw in a tweet when the American writer Cormac McCarthy died. Someone quoted uh, a line from his no novel where he said, mostly they just seem to be waiting for things to be to be a way they'd never be again. And when I read that tweet, I instantly recognized our condition. And I tweeted back, uh, that's us. Because the condition that very large numbers of humankind find their, themselves in is waiting and hoping for what they call normality to, re to return normality to return after the global financial crisis, after the pandemic, after the war in Ukraine, after the inflation that's taken off. But the truth is, that normality, whatever was good or bad about it, isn't, isn't coming back. Uh, the um, post-Keynesian economist Jamie Galbraith wrote a very prophetic book after the financial crisis called the end of normal. The old normal, the normal that became predominant in the neoliberal era is, is over. I mean, it's like, you know, well, like Alice uh, in Wonderland. We keep falling further and further down the rabbit hole. I mean, who would have predicted what happened a week ago when you had a mercenary rebellion, like something out of the Renaissance, taking place in Russia, and this march onto Moscow, which ended up in farce, and so on, as those kind of things often do. But who would have imagined a thing like that, with all sorts of frightening and destabilizing implications? Now, Adam has, in many ways, uh, played a leading role in the effort to make sense of the world that we now find ourselves in, this strange and scary world that has developed ever since the global financial crisis. He's, he didn't coin it, but he's popularized the notion of the poly crisis, of this kind of multi multiplicity of crises, economic, ecological, geopolitical, and so, so on and so forth. Um, and he's devoted, devoted enormous energy and intellectual acuity to unraveling its complexity. And just, I think it was yesterday he wrote a great article criticizing the central bank's obsession with reducing inflation to their 2% target at the, at the cost of higher un, unemployment and so on. So he's a great person to talk 
to try and make sense of what's happening. And we're going to have a conversation about it this afternoon, and there'll be plenty of opportunity to, for people to, to, to join in. I just want, being a good Marxist, uh, before I, you know, bring, uh, before I stop, I just want to register what I think are two interconnected disagreements that Adam and I have, which I try to express a bit in my book, The New Age of Catastrophe, and they are to do with totality and revolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, predictable, you really. That's a trouble, but That is what we have to talk about, yes. <laughs> yeah, we're very, very predictable. Um, totality, I think the uh, polycrisis is, an, is a good way of describing the situation. But I prefer to say that what we're faced with is a multi-dimensional crisis of the capitalist system. I think all the different elements of the poly crisis stem in particular from the, uh, the competitive accumulation of capital and in particular the destruction of nature that is its own reach. So I, I have a more kind of totalizing approach to the crisis, to the poly crisis, whatever you call it. Secondly, revolution. You know, uh, sorry, I'm a, you know, I'm a very old school Marxist. I think one solution: revolution. Adam uh, has written very well, both in his contemporary analyses and his more historical work, about the efforts of crisis managers to at least prevent the situation from getting worse. And when we're in a situation like this, that can be quite a good thing. But I think the only way out of the kind of the labyrinth that we've descended in is socialist revolution. And I think that's a bit of a point of difference. But anyway, let's see. Over to you, Adam. Well, it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here um, and to be talking with you, Alex. I've, I've um, charged through your book and enormously benefited from it. And um, it's really, I just heartily recommend it. And I, this isn't just like, you know, book presentation guff. It's really, a, it's a great read. And I, I think it's very, it's unique, actually. I don't think there's any book right now which pulls together the different strands of the conversation, be they in around the issues of popular uprisings against political status quo, um, macro finance, geopolitics in the way that Alex Books does. So I think it's a really crucial snapshot at the current moment. And everyone should go out and get a copy. Um, Alex has put his finger with, with typical acuity on what I do think are the key dividing points between us. I think both Alex and I are in the business of trying to understand complexity. And uh, on some of the intellectual reference points there, I think we could also completely agree. Like I appreciate his mobilization of the French Marxist theorist Althusser, uh, one of the great theorists of the late 20th century as a, as a, as a thinker of the complex totalities as opposed to what are known as expressive totalities. So this is the difference between a totality that has one essential principle that suffuses everything and the key to analysis to refine that essential principle. Uh, whereas Althusser insists on structured complexity, if you like, which presumes different levels and different dimensions which have to be teased apart. And I think this is a key point on which we actually wholly agree. I think the difference is where it, the level of method um, are, are twofold and they're exactly the ones that Alex acts on. So. I think the reason why we have quite a lot to say to each other and why we follow each other closely on Twitter and so on is that we're both actually interested in the totalizing approach. We're both interested in moving beyond sexual diagnosis of particular problems, be it in the financial system. So the move I make on the on the Martin Wolf essentially in the Financial Times yesterday is to say, look, Martin, you can't be discussing the problems of capitalist democracy on you know out of one side of your mouth and on the other hand advocating for an immediate and harsh return to a 2% inflation rule by massive deflation. This doesn't make any sense. You have to connect up the dots. If we're serious about, as liberals, trying to make the capitalist democracy equation work, we need to have to, we need to think holistically. So the totalizing thing, which comes from, you know, the inspirations here are, are Lukács and, and Sartre, it's a rather different Marxist tradition, but both Alex and I are kind of broad-minded on these kind of things. Um, the totalizing ambition, I think, is, is similar. The difference is that, the, that Alex cleaves to the fundamental commitment that in the end, where we're headed with totalizing analysis, the, the end point we know, which is trying to figure out how the ramified complexity that we see can be understood, not reduced to, but understood in terms of capitalism's fundamental development. Whereas I, as painful as it is, and it frustrates a lot of my friends and friends and 
and colleagues, in some sense, want to hold open the question of what the totalization ultimately is that we arrive at. And part of that is that, for me, science itself, which is a key problem also in Althusser's thinking, is this Pandora's box of openness, um, which doesn't easily close. And we ourselves, whether we like it or not, especially if you pursue something like a rigorous and serious Marxism, which makes a claim to scientificity, are kind of caught up in that problem. So that's the one big difference between us. The second big difference is indeed, I think, the promise of res resolution. And in, in, in Alex's book, which is this wonderful blend of theory and, and empirics, I mean, he quotes Adorno, another one of the rather complicated cocktail of theorists he invokes. And Adorno, it has this great line, I'll just read it out. So perspectives must be developed that displace and estrange the world, reveal it to be with its rifts and, cre and crevices as indigent and distorted as, now up to that point, Alex and I are completely on the same page. That's what I think any serious minded criticism has to be doing is opening up the world and revealing it. it's distorted. But look how Adorno finishes the sentence. It might, they must reveal it to be as indigent and distorted as it will appear one day in the messianic light. Now, that is the moment, the revolutionary moment that, that somebody like Adorno or Walter Benjamin is appealing to, or ultimately the promise of revolutionary politics. And I just, I can't, that I, I am too secular a person to be able to really follow that train of thought to its conclusion. So I end up hanging, but I want to make this concrete now. And I want to put this question back to Alex. Um, because we need to move beyond the abstraction. This is Marxism, so we should talk about theory a bit, but we should move to we should move to the concreteness. I think he and I agree absolutely fundamentally on the centrality of the question of imperialism in the current moment. He has another great line in the book where he says that Horkheimer says that if you don't want to talk about capitalism, you should shut up about fascism. Alex modifies this and says, well, really, the thing we need to talk about is imperialism. If you want to talk about the threats of war and right wing politics in the current moment, you have to engage with the question of imperialism. And he then goes on to say that it, wonderfully, because this is a properly historical book, that imperialism changes shape with time. And obviously, the imperialism of the current moment is not the same as that classically diagnosed by Lenin and Luxembourg um, or Hobson, which itself was not the same as generic empire, another crucial distinction to make, not the same as colonial settlerism either, Set, colonial settler uh, politics either, three different distinct formations, imperialism in its, in it has a very specific dynamic, and Alex insists on the specificity. And what I would just love to hear him expound on more is how he gets the totality done in relation to the current moment of imperial violence, because what I see instead and what's been really causing me to just scratch my head are the sort of symptoms that he quotes Rana Fuha talking about, where we have this utterly bizarre situation in the current moment, which to me doesn't point towards totalization, but points towards a kind of explosion of logic, where you have on the one hand, JP Morgan and the usual suspects in Wall Street wanting to dig deeper and deeper into the Chinese market, right? This is the logic of American capital, as far as I can see. And on the other hand, the military establishment of the United States and that of China, as far as we can tell, preparing for war over Taiwan. And never, I think, in my lifetime, have I seen a greater incoherence between what I in general sense, one has to take, and obviously you can't be too concrete about this, like Wall Street doesn't just simply call the shots in Washington, that's clear, the state has a degree of autonomy. But the degree of, as it were, incoherence in the current moment strikes me as so radical as to really question our ability to grasp it within conventional categories of imperialism. And I would say the same about the politics of Donald Trump, which again, like original fascism seemed to me a political formation that doesn't easily, and Alex cites quite a lot of evidence to support this question. But how do, how do we make this stuff cohere? Because I admire the ambition, I appreciate, and in fact would sort of align myself with the ambition to create these more totalizing explanations. But for me, the upshot of that right now and the alarm bell we should be ringing is not, uh -uh, I understand how this all makes sense, let me show you but rather more, oh shit, I actually think this thing is coming apart. And that for me as a historian in a previous life of the 1930s is sort of where to me, the canary in the coal mine is, you know, showing us that we're running out of oxygen. Anyway, back to you, Alex. I'd love to just get your read on how you think through that coherence that you want to reveal for us.
Okay, um, first of all I should say that there, no payments have gone from me to Adam <laughs> and no payments have been promised for afterwards. So I'm really grateful for the nice things he said about the book. Let me just say quickly, point of clarification about the quotation from Adorno. When Adorno talks about seeing the uh, contemporary world from the perspective of redemption, he has in mind what his friend, by then late friend, Walter Benjamin wrote in his thesis on the conception of history, where Benjamin fuses, not completely, but largely fuses a messianic uh, notion of redemption that comes from Jewish thought with uh, the notion, the secular notion of social socialist revolution and you know for me so it's a way of saying we need to see the contemporary world the contemporary world makes sense as a totality from the the perspective of of, of revolution does i mean but then uh, adam is saying well it doesn't doesn't make sense uh this is a oh shit moments in the in the face of incoherence and chaos chaos yeah, it is a no shit moment, no question. Uh, you know, when Putin said it was bluster and manipulation, but when he said, okay, you've imposed sanctions on us, this was on the 27th of February last, last year, so I'm putting Russian nuclear forces on alert, that was no shit moment. I mean, there, you know, there are, you know, they, to, to say that we can make sense of the present, present situation is not to, to predict a happy ending by, by any means. That's, you know, that's why one of the, one of the um, reference points at the beginning of the book is the formulation that Rosa Luxemburg takes from Engels of socialism or barbarism. You know, barbarism is a much more present reality in the world at the present time than it then it's not just an abstraction and so on and so forth. Okay, but I think I, the, the specific point that, Adam, Adam, that you made, Adam, about the contradiction between what Wall Street wants to, wants to do and uh, what the US military wants, wants to do, I don't think this is an unprecedented moment. I mean, you're, you know, you're a real historian. Um, but, uh, you know, so you can get me wrong, but, you know, if we look at July, August 1914, uh, the economic relationships between Britain and uh, Germany were very, very intimate, uh, not just at the level of trade and investment and so on and so forth, but in the extent to which German industry financed itself on the, uh, on the uh, city of London. So the City of London, there's a guy who used to be at the same university as me uh, called, called Roberts, who wrote a book about the huge financial crash that takes place at the start of the First World War, which is essentially the, the city reacting to the prospect of all their German uh, creditors defaulting on their loans, and the state has to come in and, and rescue them. The city. The relationship was very, very close. At the same time, from what I can make out, the best historiography shows that the, you know, the British, the strategic managers of British imperialism were pretty determined to go to to war with Germany. So it's the same kind of contrast that we see we see today. Um, you can put that down partly to, you know, gung-ho elements in the, the military, but I think it's, there's more strategic calculation. Yes, this is, I mean, in, to go back to the present case of China and, and the US, yes, the US benefits, say, from the supply chains that are crucial to the profitability of, of Apple that are centered on, on China, and yes, there's this, massive consumer market, uh, or now increasingly financial consumer market that Wall Street wants to, wants to tap in, in China and so on and so forth. But if we allow 
China to continue to expand, in particular, become more technologically advanced, then we're going to be sidelined. And that's what um, gives the space for the, for the very articulate uh, lobby inside the, the American ruling class who you know, want to focus on, on China. I didn't quite get what you said about in this context. Uh, I, I didn't quite what, get what you said about Trump, Adam. But, you know, Trump doesn't seem to me, you know, from the perspective of where the American ruling class is going now, Trump doesn't seem to me, you know, just like an eccentric or irrational figure. He forged the policy towards China, which Biden has, has, has radicalized. And I, that indicates, to me, you know, in a way that's frightening, you know, Trump has, what shall I say, policy innovator. I mean, it's not a thought one would ever imagine having, whatever the thoughts one might have about Trump. But for me, that suggests um, not, not simply that Trump is an innovator, you know, he's invented a particular style of politics that the far right are pursuing all over the world, world now, with varying degrees of success, but quite a lot of success. But the fact that the policy has stuck, the policy towards China has stuck and has been radicalized by Biden, suggests this is the settled view of very significant sections of the, the American ruling class. And of course, you know, Wall Street in particular has its own, <coughs> own views, and maybe this is, the problem is partly to do with the particularities of Wall Street. A hundred years ago, it was really J.P. Morgan, the great Wall Street bank, that did a lot of the kind of strategic work for American capitalism, in particular in managing the, uh, the, the results of the first, the hugely destabilizing results of the First World War in, in Europe. You know, maybe partly what we're seeing is that, you know, US, that finance, not just in the US more generally, is so geared to short-term profit that it isn't a source of that kind of strategic thinking any, anymore. Anyway, those are a few random reflections in response to what you said, Adam. Maybe if I could just quickly come back, I know we want to go to the room for, for to interventions, it'd be great to hear those. But I think, Alex, that really clarifies another, I mean, normal, uh, if you might say, a, um, a historical difference, which anchors are perhaps theoretical differences, which is that if you, it's turtles all the way down, right? Because so you and your response to me on imperialism went to 1914. And if you take, shall we say, a different historiographical position on 1914, then the original catastrophe of the 20th century, what the Germans call the Urkatastrophe, for the defining catastrophe of the 20th century, is not amenable to analysis in terms of the more straightforward imperialist scheme. And so therefore, as it were, all else follows, if you like. And so for me, that move that you made back doesn't really answer the coerced question so much as compound it. Yes, I completely agree with you that our precedents for this moment, but they pose the same fundamental analytical problem, which is can we actually form a link between our analysis of political economy and the development of capital accumulation and our analysis of violence? And as you point out in one of the brilliant kind of factoids in the book, what, 70 to 75% of all people killed in violent conflict in the last 3,000 years since the development of modern states were killed in the 20th century? And if we cannot hinge that on a logical capital accumulation, we have a huge analytical problem. To come to the, to come to the political point you make very, very quickly, I, I completely agree with you, but we shouldn't make Trump the eccentric. This is one of these terrible New York Times liberal kind of moves where they obsess about Trump. The problem I would think of as being much more structural, it has to do with the dysfunction or the, the, the ongoing turmoil in American class society and inequality that's compounded there, of course, with race that goes back to the civil rights moment the incredible polarization within American society, the kind of balkanization of the liberal elite within the American university system. Um, and the first moment where this becomes evident is not with Trump, but in 2008. And for me, the huge puzzle is, okay, 2008, you're facing this epic, I think most people would agree, existential crisis of financial capitalism in the US. And can a Republican administration whip a Republican majority in Congress into supporting a huge taxpayer underwritten bailout for American capital? And the answer is no, it can't. 
And at that point, again, it seems to me, if we take capital accumulation to be the underlying logic, which I think you know we could agree on, we have a puzzle, which is the the a big piece of the um, a, a big piece of the American political system. One of the two parties in the two party system is essentially a world from the point of view of providing the kind of comprehensive management of the overall interest of capital, which is what you would expect the political system to deliver. Sorry, my daughter's pinging me actively on Twitter, and so you may be hearing a, a lot of a lot of pings. Sorry about that. Anyway, I'll shut up. But that to me is where this problem like widens out into a broader analytical issue. Don't worry, Anna, we've got more time to go back and, back and forth. Um, I, I mean, you're, you're saying, okay, you draw a comparison with 1914 and the, the kind of tension, conflict between uh, the narrowly economic interests in particular of respectively British and American finance and the strategic decisions of the, the state which pointed in different directions. I, yeah, I mean that's a good point. I don't see, for me, I don't see the analytical problem because I think that, you know, one of the characteristics of capitalism is that we have an a internally fragmented capitalist class, you know. Okay, you can go there. Yeah, yeah. Band of hostile brothers. The state, one of the key functions of the state is to act as a unifying instance and to provide the strategic uh, direction for the capitalist class in question. This is assuming that capital, even if it operates globally, is still largely nationally constituted. But I think, you know, all the heart negri stuff has really been shown to be completely wrong in the, the past few years, so I don't think there's any problem about, about saying that. Now I think, I mean, I think you make a very good point about um, the way in which now often the state doesn't function in the strategic in, interests of, of, of capital anymore, like in the case of the, the congressional vote in two, 2008, but we can, you know, if you look, you know, you could illustrate that with the kind of stupidities of a lot of the Republican Republicans in Congress over the debt limits and all, all that kind of thing. You can also, of course, illustrate it with Brexit, with you know this utterly corrupt politician Boris Johnson when challenged about the impact of Brexit on business, saying business. Fuck business. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, <laughs> a unique moment in British history, surely, for a Tory yeah. prime, a future Tory prime minister to utter those words. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, excuse my French, but <laughs> um, but I, I think that the way I see it is one effect of I, I. It's too simplistic to say neoliberalism is over because um, you know if we look at what the central banks are doing, they show. You know, that's essentially neoliberalism on autopilot. Inflation goes up, we force up interest rates, we force up unemployment, we bash workers, we force down wages. You know, it's, it's like there's a plan in a safe, that, you know, like in a movie about the outbreak of nuclear war. You know, inflation rises, we break open the safe and implement what's in the, what the, safe, what's in the safe tells us to do. So neoliberalism isn't dead. But the global financial crisis, I think, massively disorganized the state, not universally, but certainly in the two societies where neoliberalism had gone furthest and where finance had been most empowered, namely in Britain and the United States. So, you know, this is part of the problem that the capitalist class face uh, at the minute, in both Britain and the U United States, that there's this enormous mess there are these strategic challenges, uh, strategic threats, much more center stage, much more existential for the US than, than Britain. And they don't have a state that will, they can rely on to, you know, begin to sort, sort the problem out. So, you see, I think to be a Marxist, you know, there's a, you know, in a way it goes back to the question of totality. You can think of totality as a kind of smooth working system where 
every part, you know, works smoothly with every other part to produce some kind of kind of equilibrium. But that's not how I see totality. I mean, I think you talked about structured complexity. The structured complexity can produce antagonisms that mean that the system finds it increasingly hard to work. And surely that's that's the place that that we're in at the present time. But whatever, what has produced that is the crisis of 2007-9, compounded by the growing challenge the US faces from, from China. So, you know, from the point of view of the Marxist theory of imperialism, that doesn't seem to me, you know, particularly anomalous. But, you know, maybe, maybe I've missed something. Maybe we could just, I mean, since your book um, has, a, has a major another dimension, maybe we could open this up too. And in, in, um, in the spirit of, um, of your comments just now, Alex, maybe we could think of it in these terms. Um, so I'm talking about the, the environmental question, because, because one of the astonishing things about that seems to me that in some sense, it's a 21st, late 20th, early 21st century massive indication of a basic Marxist kind of trope, which is that bourgeois society and capitalism opens up before us the, the knowledge, the realization of some absolutely general problem that it is constitutively incapable of then really addressing itself to. And both elements are true at the same time, in the same way as bourgeois political economy in the mid 19th century begins to open up vistas on the functioning of capitalism, which in the hands of somebody like Marx can be turned in this revolutionary way. This uh, key aspect of Ecolo ecological thinking as well, which has a similarly systemic problem, uh, property. After all, if anyone totalizes right now, it's the ecologists. In fact, if anyone uses a materialistic analysis of the economy, not money and prices, not at the level of commodity form, but a level of substance, it's the energy people that cash everything out in terms of CO2. It's kind of like a carbon theory of value as opposed to a labor theory of value. And yet then, as you describe in the book, uh, uh, and then imposes a line which says that's the ecological problem and then there's capitalism and whatever else right so there is this this notion of the anthropocene as though the anthropos in other words humanity as such was the driver of the crisis as opposed to however we think it and then you and i might differ whatever it is we think it but as you say in the book globalization is clearly a key element of the story and that would seem to be another one of these fronts where as you would say, as it were, a complex totality reveals crisis and reveals incoherence. And I might say the question of coherence as such is begged in a more fundamental way. But I think we can both converge on saying that one of the novelties of the current situation is that the ecological problem has moved from, as it were, being almost like a sidebar of a certain sort of liberal politics to being at the center stage of any realistic account of where we're currently at whether it's in the form of the droughts, which are hitting East Africa right now, El Nino, which is about to disrupt the global food system, or the pandemic, which we have to understand in more broader terms as a symptom of ecological dis uh, um, um, dis dysfunction and unbalance. And I thought that was one of the really important aspects of your book, that you are reaching towards incorporating that into a conjunctural analysis as well, not just as a structural thing that is obviously true, and people since Malthus have attempted to think, but actually incorporating it also as a conjunctural, um, an element of the, of the understanding of the immediate present that we're in. Not really a question so much as a comment and a kind of, yeah. uh, would you, I think for me the, 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 the puzzling aspect of this is the function of science as such, <laughs> and it's incredible influence on the situation. I mean, the th you know, a lot of the time the American liberals have banged their heads against the brick wall of Exxon and its resistance, which at some level is unpuzzling. It's a fossil fuel company that wants to keep on doing its stuff. What's in a way more puzzling is that the climate agenda has the legs that it does at all, right? In a, uh, because it's potentially such a radical proposition, but such a destabilizing proposition. Yeah, well, there's a lot there, and I need to think about what you said of not just just now, but earlier on about science and the kind of infinite process of 
uh, discovery that it represents, the impact it has on the situation. Um, but I agree, the, the, the joker in the pattern, the new element in the situation that isn't comparable to the early 20th century is the, uh, the you know, very well under, under, underway. Um, and I think, you know, I, I would, I mean, I do try to, to develop that in the book, but I, I agree it's, you know, it's a story that's unfolding all the time. And I would say to people, if you, you know, if you want to get a sense of how the poly crisis means uh, the, uh, the ecological dimension interacting in particular with the economic dimension, but also the uh, geopolitical one, uh, I would strongly recommend that people follow, follow Adam on, on Twitter. I mean, you know, we have war in Ukraine, we also have wars on the Horn of, in the Horn of Africa, in Sudan, and in, um, in Ethiopia. This is a region that has been devastated by uh, climate change, particularly in the form of de desertification in the, in the last generation. Those wars, I think, aren't intelligible uh, unless you set it in that kind of, kind of background. So this is a very important element we have to integrate into our analyses. Um, maybe, Alan, Alan, you want to come back on that, and, or you know, anything, and then we can uh, we can uh, hear. In light, in light of the time, I think it would be best if we if we opened it up to the to the audience. If there are questions in the room, you and I could go on endlessly. <laughs> I have no doubt that. Yeah. Uh, Okay, well, thank you, Adam and Alex, just to say now. Just to say now, we are going to move to the discussion part. Um, there are 400 people in the room, so we're going to try and fit as many of you in speed as possible. Uh, I'm going to call in Charlotte and uh, Alex, and Charlotte, Alex, sorry. Yeah, one person, and then after Charlotte will be Thomas, just to explain a little bit, just, uh, so we can get into lots of people to speak, we're going to ask people to speak for three minutes, and then at two minutes I will tap someone and give you an indication uh, that you've got one minute left, and then I'll ask you uh, to sum up. But well, I'll hand it over to Charlotte, it will be followed by Thomas. Hello everyone, thank you Alex, thank you Adam. Um, so my question was, was more of in the same in the vein of a concern I wanted to raise. Now my question was, how can we reconcile the short-term action we must take to solve the poly crisis with the long-term side effects which may negatively affect us? Now this may seem like a very theoretical question I'm asking, but in practice, uh, my concern is, well, how do we rec reconcile, um, you know, bringing people out of poverty with climate change? Because in practice, I don't think we actually know how energy intensive it would be to actually solve uh, problems related to class related issues. Um, and in the same vein, we also know that climate change is a very important topic within the context of the poly crisis. And as a person who is in their 20s and has been hearing more and more about climate change uh, as I was growing up, I always feel like there's. Um, a bit of a side of antagonism between uh, you know, the actions we must take in order to actually help people and in the same way we have to take action in the form of degrowth with the context of uh, environmentalism and I wonder what uh, your opinion is on, these, on this issue. Thank you very much. And you did say as well that Alex and Adam are both going to come back at the end for six minutes uh, to try and answer some of the questions. So we're going to have uh, Thomas, who will be followed by Heike Schamberg. Thanks, Bert. Um What I wanted to raise was how I think one of the key functions of capitalist ideology is shifting away focus, away from the totality, towards these individuals. And, the, and, and it's an individualization of these very structural issues, talking about how 
things like the climate crisis, instead of focusing on how the, the capital accumulation drives this, instead focus on green capitalism and green um, how we sort of create financial incentives or, or individual actions like recycling. And or mental health crisis as well, about how it's the focus on being an individual problem that we can solve individually, rather than focusing on how capitalist alienation or the, the precarity of work influences these crises. And I think that there's a systemic shift away from viewing these issues as structural issues created by capitalism towards them being individual issues and, and fighting back against this and relinking these issues towards products of capitalism, I think is one of the critical functions of, of building a sort of momentum impetus towards revolutionary movements. And that's what I want to express. Thank you. I'm going to give you a recap. We will be followed by Elliot Jay. Hi, uh, thanks to Alex and to um, Todd and Jack and um, I'm going to start with something very contentious. I'm going to try and make it as quick as possible. Um, I think the objective historical conditions for socialist revolution to occur never have been as real and as, 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 as um, it's potentially uh, there as they are today. Why? We have the vast majority of the world's population is today working class, you know, uh, the work for living. Uh, not only that, they're also literate, most of them, even, even in remote areas. They have access to uh, internet and so on and so forth, they're informed. So globalization what neoliberal globalization, if you like, has done, it has penetrated really widely and hegemonized a lot of the basic conditions we are dealing with today, which also makes it easier for people to connect. Uh, that's one thing. The cons is the dealing with the baggage of neoliberalism and obviously before Stalinism and so on and so forth, of the attacks on the working class organizations, on uh, the advance of the informality of labor, which has also its pros and cons, I can't go into. Um, that condition means we are like in a constant state of crisis, and this is what well, I'm coming uh, to the next point. I've put a little bit of a crystal ball, and it's called Argentina, and I think poly crisis concept leaves those things, uh, out, uh, those historical, recent historical occurrences, uh, out of view, and they're important. Why it is a crystal ball is because for its position in the global market and so on and so forth, in global capitalism, it is in a sense advanced in the crisis dynamics. And what you could see with the uprising was, was the revolution not really, but it had many of its elements in 2001. What happened, however, was well, that you could see that neoliberalism had undermined thoroughly its own institutions of control, like the state, like, like trade unions, and so on and so forth, and uh, in its attack on the working class. And uh, in a sense, the, the weaknesses of the working class organizations are counterbalanced by the weaknesses of the state it's confronting. So, um, poly crisis doesn't answer this. I think we need to look again at the importance of the 1997 crisis in Asia, because it directly impacted on countries like Argentina, from which it never recovered. And the analysis at the time of economists was wrong about its limitations. While the world of capitalism continued to grow, it began to lose in its dynamic growth, even China. And I think that is crucial to understand. We're not talking about poly, poly crisis in that sense. Latin America, to some extent, had a possibility for 10 years in the so-called pink, wrongly dominated, de denominated pink um, um, moment, um, to come up with an ideological way out from the ruling classes of the crisis and, and for the moment. They didn't achieve that. Neoliberalism is continuing full blown. And what we're seeing today is the expansion of precisely that very same crisis of the system. And this is what we talk about totality. And the way to fight it, I think, is to re rebuild the organization of the working class.
respond or they feel the responsibility to, to safeguard American capitalism, even if those capitalists themselves don't necessarily see their interests being put forward. For example, with the, the emergence of China as a manufacturing kind of stronghold dealing with a lot of high technology from the United States. You could say that the United States' competitiveness in the long term is being challenged. While this doesn't, is not an immediate kind of profit struggle for all over American firms, especially people in Wall Street, I mean, they're still making their profit if it's produced in China or America. But for a lot of American capitalists that might be based in manufacturing while in industries that are dependent on American industry, I think it's easy to see that I mean, that competitiveness being lost Kind of harms their long-term interests, and in what sense do you think that kind of calculation has to play in you know, the finance capitalists sort of being transnational, they don't really care about what center is making that profit for them, versus you know, much more kind of smaller bourgeois elements, which might care about you know, the fact that their city is the one where wealth is being created, their employees are the ones that, that kind of you know, are employed in those sectors. And one final kind of thought as well is, I mean, how long do you think ideas about you know, what, what is an American capitalist nowadays, right? If they're working from the Caribbean or they can just move their money from, from one place to the next. In the, and in the flash of an eye, like what, what separates an American capitalist from a British capitalist from even someone like a Russian capitalist, most of whom live in the UK anyways. So I think kind of building boundaries between sort of what is capitalist interest in one country or capitalist interest in general, you know, I think that those are kind of ideas that I'd be glad to have you explore. Thank you. I'm calling Eric now. He will be followed by Steve Gar. I love listening to the back and forth to you on, on, on all these horrors and complexity and how to come together. So I just have one more question. I have one question if you can fit something else in. Because one, you know, terrifying result of the economic crisis is a rise of fascism and a, and a, and a, and a far of fascist discourse, ideologies, and movements. Um, and also that are that are distinct from you know the everyday violence of, of uh, and oppression of capitalist states, but also how the far right is influencing I I existing states already and how they respond to the to the crisis. Um, so I just just uh, anyway that, that that that's all. Just uh, it, a little bit. I'd be interested in hearing from both of you. You know what that relation is, and and how uh, the far right movement itself seems to be fractured and, and, and incoherent. And yet, there's still lessons I think about about you know what fascism is that we can we can learn and, and apply to that. And yes, I want to understand it, but I, maybe it's too much to ask from both of you. But to understand it in a way to to figure out how to how to best fight this in a, in a world where we can't just return to normal. I'm going to bring in Steve Gaw, who will be our last speaker, and then I'm going to bring Alex and Adam back in. Yes, I just want to address this contribution really to, to um, Adam Tooze, um, uh, especially specifically about uh, uh, his book The Deluge. Uh, he was writing it when uh, it was published in 2014, when most historians uh, were writing. Uh, about the period 1914 1918, uh, you write about the interwar years, and I think that, that there are some parallels with what uh, is happening today. But I, just, I did want to take you to task about the, the chapter on reparations, where you're quite critical of uh, uh, John J. M. Keynes and his attempt for the publication of the economic consequences of peace to try and charge. Uh, change the direction of travel, uh, those putting together the new world order. So that's a phrase we hear quite often these days. Uh, and he was doing it presumably by attempting to mobilise public opinion because he didn't have a, a revolutionary party to, uh, to, do, to do that for him. Uh, and to try and put forward his own solution, a uh, capital solution, an international loan consortium. But it was an attempt to mitigate 
the worst effects of uh, the development of Carthaginian peace. Uh, he failed uh, in his end of endeavour, and in spite of uh, another scathing critique of Britain's Chancellor and the economic consequences of Mr. Churchill, he also failed to prevent the UK government from putting the economy back uh, on the gold standard, in fact, winding the clock back uh, as a measure which only benefited the financiers and the bankers and precipitated through deflation and credit restriction the threat of massive unemployment, which he predicted. Um, and ultimately, uh, led to the provoking of the British working class into taking mass action, uh, the general strike, which was ultimately sold out, sold out um, by the trade union leaders. So I don't want to exaggerate uh, uh, the, the, or the claim that there are definite parallels with what's happening today. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't call what happened then a poly crisis, but I do think that uh, Keynes, while he could be criticised for many things, certainly from a Marxist point of view, uh, his, his efforts to try and save the system, but it seems to be he acted from, from a somewhat altruistic motive in trying to prevent the uh, capitalist class from inflicting the worst excesses on the post-war world. Uh, I think for that he deserves some credit. I say thank you to everyone who spoke in today's session and who listened. Before I bring Alex and Adam back, I've got a couple of announcements for you. Tonight, Marxism Festival is taking over the Institute of Education Bar, not Muddy's. So I hope everybody will make it over there at the end of the last session. And tomorrow, there was a session on France, Sunday morning, which uh, the title has changed. It's now France and Revolt Strikes riots and resistance, but we'll be hearing from French activists on the riots taking place in response to the death of a teenager at the hands of the police, and that's tomorrow uh, at 10 o'clock in the Brunei Fetch Theatre. And just to say, everybody can get Adams and Alex's books at Bookmarks, I encourage everybody to go over and uh, spend your money there, and I'll hand over to Adam. Uh, thanks for that, that brilliant uh, range uh, of, of, that, of that comments there from the audience. Um, um, the really wish I was in the room. Um, I mean, the Keynes, the Keynes example, of course, weighs heavily on anyone um, in my position in the world, the kind of self identified like liberal, gadfly, journalist, whatever you call me. Um, you know, he is in some sense the role model, but also, as the, as the question suggested, also an example of how the sort of tactics of influence that folks like myself pursue can also be frustrated at key moments. There's no question about that. I think um, I wouldn't disagree at all with the general diagnosis that he's no bad guy, and, and, that, and that indeed there is a project here, and that indeed there is a project here of essentially of liberal hegemony. I mean, that's that's what Keynes is trying to revive. And though he didn't have a revolutionary party at his disposal, he had what was left of the Liberal Party at the time, which becomes a key vehicle for, as he would put it, in extraordinarily condescending terms, providing the brains, if you like, for the the power struggle that's going on between the British Labour movement and the established interests in British society at the time. And he would see Bretton Woods and the welfare state solution after 45 as the vector product of that. Right. So it's a strategy of influence from the outside, but one, oh, sorry, it's a strategy of influence from the inside, but with relatively weak cards, which plays to its strengths the different types of coalition. And one of the key problems of the current moment for everyone in this kind of position is that that counterbalance is not there, right? So that's, I think, the opening thing to say is that the, the lopsidedness of class forces has to be reckoned with. And we live, and I would entirely agree with Alex in this respect, we live under the shadow in the aftermath of neoliberalism irrevocably. Um, one point I wanted to make quickly, and I'm going to be quick now. I mean, why do we care about this debate about the coherence of imperialism and its logic? Why do we care about it? And, and I, I really like the way that Alex has taken us to say, look, Adam, why are you stressing this coherence thing so much? Any serious analysis of imperialism and capitalism will point to its incoherence. We all agree on this. Band of brothers, you know, you could call it a mean girls problem to use a less gendered image, like a bunch of factious individuals and interests fighting each other in a vicious way is what we think this system is but and i that's great so then we converge on that description if that's the case 
The problem is that our model doesn't give us much predictive power, because if you're looking at the world and saying it is constitutively incoherent and conflictual, your problem then is that you really don't have much predictive oomph. What you've got is a series of conjunctional analysis, which you just have to then do, which then pushes you into the kind of space where, as I know from experience, you can find very distinguished senior Marxist figures accusing you of being somebody who only understands the short run and nothing more than conjuncture. Um, and uh, I don't need to go on about that. Two points were made about profit and capital interest. I think that's really quite interesting. And I would take that point. I'm not sure that it acts ex ante as a driver of strategy ahead of time. But this idea that perhaps what's going on in the background is that American business is losing out in China. But I think what it does ex post, given that American business hasn't been making the money, it changes the game in Washington because it enables nationalist protectionist strategies to be more plausible because the big promise of the Chinese market is not as powerful as it once was. Where we're we going to see this, track this, follow these stories is in the car space, automotive because the Chinese are absolutely destroying the big European manufacturers in their own market in the EV and the electric vehicle space. And that will totally disentangle the Chinese and German economies at a strategic point, and it will free up various types of option for an alignment with Washington that Berlin might currently not be terribly sympathetic to. But by the time VW, BMW and Mercedes have lost their market share in China, the logic of alignment with China will be less compelling. So I, I, think, I think that's a compelling argument ex post rather than ex ante so afterwards retrospectively as it were structurally underpinning rather than again predicting what's what what what's happening i want to end though on three more positive points very quickly staccato i couldn't hear the long intervention about the state of the current global working class but it started in a way which i can totally recognize and sympathize with even from a liberal point of view which is yes and this was an element of optimism i kind of missed in in alex's brilliant book which is it is absolutely true that there are eight billion of us on the planet right now which despite disasters are better fed better nourished living longer dying less in childbirth and as infants than ever before and the educational level of humanity isn't like it has never been before and there is huge capacity therefore for collective liberation for scientific breakthroughs of all kinds which should be ultimately our main source of hope, right? That's the kind of place where a humanism converges with a Marxism in a space that's really very familiar. The next point is the very first intervention started with this nasty dilemma. Can we improve the condition of the vast majority of people without running into climate constraints? And there, the good news is absolutely we can because 10% of the world's population are responsible for 50% of the total global climate emissions. So there is huge room for assertive redistributive politics which can which dramatically pulls back on the carbon consumption of not ordinary folks the vast majority of people in the room to here today can take a big sigh of relief no it's the top one percent that do all of the damage if you're a frequent flyer like me you are a carbon criminal you need to be taxed you need to be banned you need to be rationed in whatever way this is a problem which is amenable to solutions and that hard trade-off is not hard and then i wanted to go to the okay. final point about individualism and then i'll shut up the, the point about individualism and the function of bourgeois ideology is very well taken. Um, and But on the other hand, the individual harms, as we all know from our own personal experience, are real. And that, I think, is also a dilemma for progressive politics, which is that you have to think seriously both about the collective condition and your very cutting collective systemic analysis, whilst taking seriously the individual harm afflicting you and those around you. And one of the solutions to that dilemma is the party for right one of the solutions to that dilemma is various types of collective action and certainly for me as a young person the swp functioned in this kind of way and and that's why i'm showing up at this event right because i feel the degree of loyalty to the experience of that collective action and it's rare and it's something to cherish and to develop and that i think is the way in which a progressive politics has to meet the double obligation of recognizing the systemic logics and simultaneously attending to and caring for the individual harm that is real as well in the ideological form in with which we exist. We are, whether we like it or not, subjectified, and there's no easy way of getting away from that. Okay, um, lots of great questions and comments from the floor and lots of really interesting and provocative thoughts from 
from Adam. I can only respond to 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 a few few points, both from him and from other other people. Firstly, someone asked, is the conflict between the U.S. and um, China over Taiwan to do with who controls the the chip industry? Not really. Not really, because you know the Taiwanese are happy to sell chips to. To, to, to anyone, it's not, there's no problem of access to the, to the, to the chips. Uh, and, the, you know, the real, you know, going back to the question of incoherence, or maybe being a bit more Marxist, the contradictions, the contradiction is, if the US went to war with China over Taiwan, the probable result would be the at least partial destruction of the, Taiwanese advanced chip industry, which would have very serious effects on the on the global global economy. So you could, that's a point where the the tension between the ge geopolitical competition, which I think is related to long term long term um, the long term direction of development of both China and the, and the U.S. The, the tension the conflict contradiction between that and the geopolitical conflict and the uh, economic, the more immediate economic interest is very strong. Adam says, well, the incoherence means there's a lack of predictive power. I'm not sure that's completely true. I mean, those of us who tried to stick with the Marxist theory of imperialism, but to also to improve it, to develop it, to make it more um, more adequate in various respects. When there were all the debates about globalization at the beginning of the 21st century, we were able to anticipate the course of development better than the people like Tony Negri and so on, who said, you know, well, he and Michael Hart said, imperialism is, is over, geopolitical conflict is obsolete. Well, you know, Sometimes there are crucial experiments in the social sciences, and that crucial experiment uh, of the last couple, couple of years has shown that those who persisted with the Marxist theory of imperialism would write. So, I, you know, prediction in the social sciences is, you know, uh, often a diff difficult thing, but I wouldn't say there's no predictive power to the, uh, to the, the, the Marxist theory of imperialism. On the question of fascism, which Eric, also from New York, raised, I mean, I think here there's a, a disagreement between me and Adam that ha hasn't really come up, which that he, he's one of the people who thinks that it's better to talk in terms of um, post-fascism, of far-right parties that don't pursue the kind of classical fascist project, although they represent a break from mainstream neoliberal, neoliberal politics. And I would say it's probably true that the predominant pattern, pattern so, so far, and in particular with both the Nazis and the Italian fascists, there's a very close relationship between fascism and war. They come from war, at the core of the fascist formations are ex-combatants from the First World War, and they seek you know, to refight the First World War and win this time round, which they tried unsuccessfully after 19, 1939. And there are very important differences. But I think, I would say, don't underestimate the potential for radicalization in the situation. It's interesting if you look at Giorgia Meloni in Italy, who's clearly a very clever politician. She's very careful to stick with NATO over Ukraine, not to, um, uh, to, to largely stick with the, the kind of economic parameters set by the, the EU and the European Central Bank. But I think that's a tactical position. So the other day, she attacked the European Central Bank for continually rising interest rates. If you look at her past, there are classic, fake, pseudo-anti-capitalist speeches that we've made. You know, in other words, if the poly crisis is going to get worse, then there's a potential for a process of radicalization that can take us much closer to, to, to classical fascism. 
Um, Alan has answered Charlotte Alex's very important question, which was really, I think, about the tensions between the different dimensions of the poly, poly crisis. Does it, addressing poverty undermine the attempt to address climate change? And I think it's very important to say, if, um, if you address poverty through serious and systematic um, uh, policies of redistribution, then this will contribute to addressing climate change rather than rather than under, undermining it. Um, okay, I want to I want really to leave leave it there. I mean, the the question hanging over all of us in this debate is how we get uh, the the power to begin to address the uh, the all these terrible threats that we face. Where's, where's that power going to come? And I agree broadly with Heidegger, who talked about Argentina in 2001 and so on, that the power is there if it can be mobilized from the world's working, working class. So I share, I share her, her, her and indeed Adam's optimism. And I think, of course, it is tremendously emotionally wearing, personally, individually, to live through this this period, I, you know, with the pandemic, I began to understand. I mean, the, first, the Second World War drastically changed my parents' lives in ways I can't talk about, as it did to many, many people. Um, and I never understood till the pandemic happened how you could have this event that affects everyone and shakes up everyone's lives in a dramatic way, so that you know the pieces when they land afterwards, land often in very different places, socially, geographically, and so on and so forth. It's difficult to live through that, but in terms of how we, how we move towards getting that power, actually, Adam uh, gave the answer. I mean, he may be a liberal gadfly, but he's got <laughs> a, a bit of a sympathy for, for we Marxists, and the, the benefits, not simply in terms of greater power, but also in the benefits in terms, the benefits of solidarity, of acting together collectively, how that can help us to get through this very difficult and terrifying situation. And of course, that's one of the reasons to, to build revolutionary parties like the SWP. Anyway, I talked too long. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks in particular to Adam for being such a great intellectual. Thank you.